How do fractional CMOs hit the ground running? Hi, I'm Dean Way. Welcome back to Fractional CMOs and the 90 Day Win. There's a lot of variety in how they kick off a new client engagement. Um, there's so much variety. It's valuable to just listen to what opportunities they look for and what they tackle first and what they wish wasn't true when they start a new project. So uh, let's find out. Hi, Mark. Hey, how you doing, Dean? Good, thank you. Uh, Mark, so the podcast is based on a hypothetical one-year engagement. You're the fractional CMO, right? Today's day one. Uh, we'll talk about early wins, you know, in a second. But like, what one or two problems do you normally see when you start a new engagement, or do you just go looking for one these one or two problems because you see them all the time? And uh, also, let the audience know a little bit about yourself. Yeah, Mark Evans, uh, fractional CMO. Company is called Marketing Spark, and website is marketingspark.co. I've been doing this since 2020, and I work with companies, most of them B two B SaaS, with less than five million dollars in sales. When I start an engagement, I want to know from the get-go what their expectations are. And I'm not talking we need more leads and sales, but I want to know what their problems are and right. what success looks like for them. It's important to make sure that we're aligned because a fractional CMO engagement is actually a partnership. It's a very intimate partnership in which both sides need to understand how each other is going to work, what the rules of engagement are and what success is going to look like three, six, 12 months from now. So I want to make sure that we're both on the same page. And if not, then things can go pear-shaped really quickly. So alignment, expectations, and making sure that we know what the North Star goal is matters, really matters to me and matters to the client. Moshe, hi. Hey, uh, my name is any... Moshe. Are there any problems that you normally either just like, I'm going to, every time I start, I'm going to, I'm going to find this, my clients for some reason always end up like this, or is there like problems that you normally, you know, like go looking for, uh, on the, on the first day. And uh, I interrupted you, I think, but like, let the audience know a little bit about you. Absolutely. Just by way of introduction, I am the founder and chief growth partner at growth.co. That's growth without the O. Uh, we are a fractional CMO practice specifically focused on early stage startups. And we help build that function for growth, including strategy tools and team uh, to empower the, the company to then take it over internally and, and uh, work ourselves out of a job, so to speak. Um, one thing that we have established is always focused on uh, positioning first and um, you know, be, it takes, it's sometimes a challenge to convince founders that you have to kind of slow down to speed up. Everybody wants, you know, immediate focus on uh, lead gen growth, um, customer acquisition, whatever the, yeah. the main KPI that they're looking for, um, which we found, we found that the hard way that, you know, when you, when you do that, um, inevitably you end up spending a lot of time and money on generating the wrong type of lead that doesn't convert or churns. Um, so slowing down to really understand who the ICP is, who un to understand what the right messaging is, how the customers perceive you, how you want to be perceived, all of that, um, doing your positioning upfront is, uh, I think, critical. And, and we we won't take on an engagement who doesn't agree to allow us to do that first. Okay. Uh, Moshe, uh, I'm going to stay with you for a second. But by the way, uh, I, I, I confess I have not been to your website, but that I don't know if you realize that the way you described it, growth without the O, if you consider O as OH as like a surprise, that's a great mm -hmm. slogan, right? No surprises, just growth. Love that. Intentional or not, it worked out great. Uh, okay, then that's like the problems. What sort of early wins do or, you know, or, I hate the term low hanging fruit. I got to stop using that. Uh, do you like, like to sort of put up on the scoreboard in the first 90 days? Yeah. So, of course, while we're doing that deep dive exercise to figure out the right positioning, we're talking to internal stakeholders, we're talking to sales folks who have the closest ear to the customer. And ideally, we're also talking to customers and even non-customers in the ICP mm -hmm. um, to get a full understanding. While we're doing that and we're building the strategy, you don't want to be spending too much time. It's difficult right, to have that kind of um, that period where the customer is kind of starting to think, you know, what, what did I sign up here for? I'm paying them and I'm not seeing any results. So you do want to deliver some quick wins during that period. Um, and even if, uh, you know, even if they're small and, and not super consequential to the long-term strategy, just showing that value immediately um, definitely buys you some of that time that you need to, to do the heavy lifting. Um, so some quick places to look often are uh, if they're already running um, any sort of ads 
uh, and what I find with startups, especially when when they hire us, it's often because they've started with a junior marketer or an agency right. that has a lot of tactics, but no strategy. Um, and that's what they're hiring us for is to really to figure out what that strategy should be. So when you start to peel back the, uh, you know, you don't have to go too deep on the tactics. Oftentimes you'll find quick wins on wasted spend in AdWords, for example, um, you know, some broken uh, email automation um, uh, flows if you look in the CRM or HubSpot or whatever they're using. Um, and also the funnel, I think, is is a critical place to to look immediately for opportunities to just improve that experience because oftentimes the, uh, the focus is on some sort of uh, lead generation inbound uh, effort or, or uh, form or process. And if you can make quick improvements there, you can get some uh, nice gains immediately. Uh, so that, those are some, some easy places to look. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the bigger work around, you know, how do you message to the customer, you know, sometimes even a rebranding uh, is necessary or, or a repositioning that'll take some time and you want to be able to show something during that period. All right. Oh, oh and um, statistics on this podcast tell me that most of the people who listen are non-marketing people and CEOs. So, uh, Mark, I'm going to ask you about what wins you like to put in first 90 days. But just to clarify for anyone listening, ICP, which is what uh, Moshe mentioned, is ideal customer profile. So, Mark, what do you think? What do you go after in the first 90 days on the win side? Yeah, I, I agree with Moshe in terms of the overall approach. One of the things that you need to think about is when a company hires a fractional, it's a it's a big deal. It's a leap of faith. They probably haven't done a lot of marketing, haven't spent a lot of marketing. As Moshe said, they probably at most hired a, a junior marketer or maybe dabbled with an agency and it hasn't worked very well. So you want to validate that they've made the right decision. And yes, yeah. you do need to do the positioning and understand what the marketing strategy is and what the product is. But you want to make sure that they feel confident almost right away that they've got someone who's going to move the needle for them, whether in a big or small way. So that's, it's a mindset. And if you build trust and confidence, then the rest of engagement will be a lot easier. So as far as the tactical part of quick wins, a website review often reveals lots and lots of things that can be easily and quickly fixed. It's links that don't work, CTAs that are ineffective or confusing, all that stuff. copy that, as you know, Dean, that, you know, doesn't really tell the message, the story that you want to tell. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you can sort of pick off some of the low hanging marketing and sales enablement uh, needs. So it could be things as simple as testimonials, case studies, battle cards for salespeople, um, uh, uh, maybe a quick infographic, updating the homepage. There's lots of little things that you can do without much. Um, it doesn't need, require a lot of grunt work. It just can happen right away because, you know, like Moshe and a lot of fractional CMOs will tell you, they've been there, done that. You know right away when you see a problem and you can fix it. And so overall, like within the, the first 30 days, you want to be doing those quick wins. You want to be demonstrating value. You want to build trust. And in the background, you want to, build out your positioning, get that strategic narrative down, build out a plan of attack and make people feel confident that yes, we're on the right path and I'm, I'm going to be dealing with the right person who's going to get us there. So then uh, Mark, what do you normally find that customers either haven't seen like, and I, I don't mean like they haven't seen because it hasn't happened. I mean, it's right in front of them, but they don't see it uh, in their own business or don't know about their business and marketing uh, until you start. Well, as I said off the top, most of my clients are B2B SaaS companies with less yeah. than $5 million in sales. They've done nowhere little marketing. So they have no in-house or very little oh, in-house okay. uh, yeah, marketing, right. mar marketing expertise or, or, or knowledge for that matter. So they don't know what they don't know. What they've usually got is a, is a good product. Uh, most cases, product market fit, and they've got customers. And they're just, it's sales driven or product driven. It's, it's brute force, usually by the CEO slash founder. One thing that they don't understand is the importance and the value of proper brand positioning. Because if you don't have a story that tells the world what you do, who you serve, the value that you deliver, and how you're unique, better, or different, then you're going to get lost. You're, you're never going to break through because every single market has dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of competitors. 
the CRM space, for example, has more than 600 companies battling for attention. So without brand positioning to differentiate yourself, it doesn't matter what you do from a sales and marketing perspective, it won't break through. You'll be spinning your wheels. So the number one thing that I emphasize when I'm talking to companies is you, you've got to have a great story. You've got to have a clear story. Otherwise, nothing else matters. And I'm, I'm probably being overly dramatic, but that's the way I see the world. No, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong, man. Or to put it another way, um, strangers are not interested in you and not working out and doing 90% of the work uh, of the thinking and feeling to tell them your story and expecting them to put in all that labor to do it, you're not going to have a good day. They no. got lots of other stuff. And I would, I would just, just to build on what Mark is yeah. saying, a lot of times those founders often got that first kind of critical momentum in their uh, immediate sphere of influence, right. you know, friend, uh, um, colleagues, um, two degree um, connections that it's e relatively easier to sell to. And sometimes they got early attraction with like a really hardcore early adopter audience. And they just think like, okay, yeah, you know, everybody understands it, everybody loves it, everybody gets it. But no, as soon as they hit saturate that first um, uh, kind of segment of the adoption curve, they really don't have a strategy to get beyond that. And without what Mark was describing of really differentiating yourself and being able to tell a story of what, why you, you know, why should I care? What value are you going to provide to me? All of those things, they're never going to grow past that that initial uh, kind of uh, market segment. Yeah, I've got a slide that I show uh, folks and it's like marketing in three sentences and I won't go through the whole thing, but the very first sentence is some number of strangers need to be told that you exist and what you sell. Yeah, the interesting There's thing- There's no way around that step. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing, yeah. the other interesting thing about positioning is that the story changes constantly. So it's not a- it's not a write it in, etch it in stone and that's it. Mm -hmm. It evolves because economic conditions, uh, competitive issues, the, the overall um, economic, uh, the overall sort of landscape and what, what your buyers want, what your customers want. And so it's really hard for entrepreneurs and CEOs to get their heads around the fact that, yes, I have to create positioning, but then I have to change it on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and that's a hard sell sometimes, but that's what Moshe and I do is we, we tell them that story matters. And if you don't have it, it's hard to compete. Wait, is it a hard sell to tell them that they're going to have to iterate through the, the, their positioning and like, you know, adapt, or is it a hard uh, sell to tell them that they're not, that they can't? It's a hard sell to tell them that they're going to have to iterate. Because, yeah. you know, they, they have a very biased view of the world. They see their product through a specific lens. And to change the story means that that they have to reload on who they are and why they matter. But that's just the nature of the beast is that nothing is static. You can't, you know, rest yeah. on your laurels is that everything changes and you got to change along with it. Yeah. I tell them, unless you're going to write what's on your own gravestone, everything else in your life you ever write, you can rewrite it. Mm. <laughs> So don't worry about it. Just do your best, and then we'll, think, you know, we'll iterate later. Uh, okay. So, so Moshe, um, what do you think? Given the audience for this, right? What do you think a CEO should understand about fractional CMOS to get like to squeeze maximum value out of the one year that they've that they've agreed to pay this fractional CMO? Uh, I think the the most critical is understanding why you're hiring them and what you're hoping to accomplish during that period. Um, and having uh, a real kind of give and take partnership type approach to the engagement, that it's not just a um, kind of set it and forget it. I brought them in, it's their problem now, and I'll see them in a year. Right. Obviously that's that's just not gonna work, right? Um, and it sounds like Mark also works with, with earlier stage smaller companies. So it's even more important in that case um, because so many things change and, and there's so many things that are still um, up in the air at those stages. You have to be working closely with them. The um, on, on the flip side, you know, when, when hiring a fractional CMO, yes, you should have a plan of action, but of course that, that uh, plan is going to change and iterate and, and morph as time uh, progresses and as the needs change. So just being flexible there is important. Uh, the other big thing I think is, is recognizing that a CMO, whether they're fractional or not, is a CMO, and um, you know, hopefully they can still write an email or you know edit edit a AdWords campaign or uh, you know 
go into your CRM and make changes, uh, they should have that muscle, but you're not getting the most value for your money if that's what you're paying a senior yeah. level person to do. So understanding that the CMO's job is is to build the program, to set the strategy, to work with you on, on direction and vision, um, and having the resourcing to support that individual, whether internally or with contractors, with agencies, um, in order to make sure that the execution gets done. Because the same way that I said earlier, execution without strategy is um, usually a wasted effort. Strategy without ex execution is also a wasted effort. So having the uh, resourcing to then implement all of those uh, those strategies, campaigns, ideas, whatever the, the CMO is putting in place and not expecting the CMO to do it because, you know, sure they can in most cases, but it's just not, you know, you, you can get much, much cheaper resource to do that kind of yeah. stuff. Mark, I'm going to ask you the same question, but I'm going to like twist it a little bit. Uh, in your experience, how do CEOs waste money by when they hire a fractional CMO? Well, the <laughs> fundamental waste of money is is hiring a fractional CMO when they don't need a fractional CMO, yeah. or they're not ready for a third party to come in and help them. They they just don't have the resources or commitment or the mindset to move forward with marketing. They get seduced by the fact that marketing is sexy, and a lot of other companies are doing it, but from an organizational point of view, from a financial point of view, they just don't have the firepower to move forward. I told with... my wife that marketing is a second <laughs> field, but she <laughs> <doesn't believe. laughs> yeah, My wife feels the same way, but that is one of the, the biggest obstacles. She's and in finance, she's like, no, it's not. Yeah. I mean, and I think the other thing uh, when you're, when you're dealing with entrepreneurs and CEOs is that they get very excited about, about marketing, about strategy, about planning until rubber hits the road. And then you say to them, well, this plan is going to cost you 50,000, a hundred thousand dollars. And then they, they have sticker shock because they forget the fact that to make money, you got to spend money. And so that would be the biggest issues that I run into as a fractional CMO. All right. And then I have um, um, a lot or well, two, two more questions for you guys. Uh, and uh, so this one, I need to phrase a little delicately. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the majority of the audience, according to the stats, are CEOs and non-marketing execs, right? But there's like a significant chunk of the audience that are other fractional CMOs. So I wanted you to pass along to the entire audience, uh, given that obviously like every company and everyone in sales and everyone everywhere, you talk to a lot more prospects than ever become clients, right? That's the nature of it. You know, whether that's like 10 prospects equals one client or whatever, right? Like uh, as uh, a fractional CMO is talking to prospects, and this will be valuable for the CEOs as well, right? As you're talking to prospects, like what are some more of the signs or red flags that this is not going to be a good situation if you sign up with these guys? We'll start with Moshe. Sure. Um what like sets off an alarm? Like, I, uh, yeah, these guys. No, man, no. So I, I try to be uh, as transparent as possible in that uh, initial period. In, in often uh, erring on the side of of sharing too much and scaring away people, because yeah. um, I'd rather find out before we sign the dotted line that it's not a fit. Um, mm -hmm. Because you know. The reason we got into the factional game was to be able to work with, uh, you know, companies that we enjoy working with and, and having that that flexibility to um, uh, take on different projects. And, and uh, it's it's very interesting and it's exciting to have uh, multiple different gigs at once. But, you know, life is short. So why work with with engagements that they're not happy with your work or you're not, you know, getting getting to be to provide the most value. Uh, so. Um, I would say first thing is is cost and like you know to the last question not just cost of our engagement but just the overall kind of like what is the strategy and budget around your entire marketing and growth program um, and understanding if you're ready to make that investment or not. Um, the other thing again, kind of just double clicking on some of the things we were talking about earlier that marketing does not equal advertising. Marketing is bigger than advertising. So if they're not prepared to um, include the other areas of marketing, like we talked about positioning, right. branding. Mm -hmm. um, they just want advertising, you know, there's a whole list of agencies that I'll send them to that you like, yeah, they can do your advertising for you. Um, you know, marketing is bigger than that. Um, 
of course there's there's a personality component to it so you just want to vet them like you vet any relationship if you guys if if you'll get along with each other that is important if not you know there's you know maybe refer them off to, to another cmo that is more their vibe um that process i think is is important one thing that i personally haven't done so i'm going to tell the the fractional cmos in the audience to say, do as i say not as i do <laughs> in this case is um adopting kind of that that classic um that a lot of uh, coaches and solopreneurs have adopted it works really well in terms of um having very lightweight engagements that you can kind of start to build that relationship so maybe you start mm -hmm. with some sort of like um uh content ebook uh asynchronous Magnet, course Magnet. exactly and then and then you move them down into like a synchronous uh, kind of cohort type program which is kind of mid uh mid level in terms of cost structure and then you have that one on one which is like the high cost the high ticket item um i think that it's important for two reasons number one it, it improves your funnel um because right now when i talk to uh somebody I don't have that. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm not practicing what I preach here, but yeah. um, when I talk to somebody, they're either going to sign a, you know, 50, $70,000 engagement or whatever that looks like, or they're, they're not, and there's no in between. So obviously that's a big, that's a big risk and big lift for that. I'm asking of them. Whereas if they're, if you have smaller things that you can kind of get them into the, into the fold, um, that's an easier kind of starting point to a relationship. Uh, the other thing is that, you have the ability to start vetting each other during that process. So, you know, if you start to work right. with somebody and they're part of a group or a, co a cohort of coaching that you're doing, or, um, you know, kind of like a strategy group or workshop, then you can see during that workshop, you know, is this somebody that I'd want to take on as a client and vice versa, is this a CMO that I'd want to take on full time? So I think that having those um, is, is valuable and something that, uh, you know, certainly uh, I aim to implement as well. <laughs> yeah, you basically just described my process. There's a, um, uh, if you go to winstonwrites.com, there's like a one minute video and it explains what happens in a thousand dollar workshop. And the workshop includes um, rewriting usually someone's homepage because whose homepage doesn't need a rewrite, right? And like that's, that's the first step in like an engagement with me. And like, it's small enough that it's sort of a quick hit and doesn't take very long, but it's, it's, uh, big enough that nobody who's just kicking the tires, uh, you know, comes back. So yeah, yeah, you're right. So yeah, do as I do people <laughs> and, and do as Moshe says, but doesn't do yet. And Mark, how about you? What are sort of like, what are, what are some more of the red flags that like, uh, this is not going to be a good engagement for me. To be honest, it, like I've been doing this, been a consultant since 2008 and you get a gut feel about yeah. or your spider sense about who's a good client and not. I think the one thing that I do want to stress is that, when you're talking to a prospect, it's it's a two way negotiation. So you're negotiating to work with them, uh, and they're negotiating to work with you. And because at the end of the day, it is a partnership. It, it's a it's a hopefully it's a three or six or twelve month partnership. So you have to know that it's the right fit, and you want to be convinced that you can be set up for success as opposed to failure. And you got to poke them and they got to poke you and you got to, you got to really find out if there's, there's really the right fit, the good fit there. So that's point number one. And, and like Moshe said, I'm, I'm very transparent about what I'm really good at, which is things like brand strategy, go to market mm -hmm. planning, overseeing tactical execution and the things that I'm not good at. And, and I want to be clear to any prospect that these are the ways and these, this is how I can help you specifically. And if they tell me otherwise, if they're looking for things that that aren't in my wheelhouse, then I'm, I'm, I don't say no, but what I do say is no but or no and. I don't do that, but I know right. three other fractional CMOs or three other marketing consultants who could do a much better job than me because they've got different skill sets. And I would love to connect you with them. And so what you do, what you're doing is really you're building trust in a relationship. So that at some point in time, those CEOs yeah. will be at their EO groups or their networking groups, and they'll come across somebody who looking for the type of services that I offer. And they'll go, yeah, I was talking to a guy. I didn't hire him, but sounds like a really good guy. You should talk to him. And, and that's sort of my approach to, to uh, talking to prospects and, and just trying to build a relationship and see where it goes from there. All right. Yeah. Um, Mark, so... Mark, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Mark. I, I, let me see if, if the both of you agree with, with the statement. I've never regretted not taking on a client that <laughs> didn't didn't feel right. Yeah, 
I mean, I would even advise people like if you, uh, I see so many people still and you can do like a free sort of meeting with them, you know, you set it up on calendar or whatever, and it's 30 minutes long. And I, I tell them like, I think our conversation is going to go great, but just so you know, like why not set it to 15 minutes and just tell Calendly to buffer 15 minutes after it and not put anyone else in there. So if you need more, you need more. Mm -hmm. There's no worse feeling than having a, you know, agreeing to like a 30 minute initial meeting with someone and knowing 60 seconds in, this is never going to go anywhere. Yeah. And I've just committed another 20, 29 minutes of our lives to this when it's not going to go anywhere. It's like going on a first date for dinner as opposed to coffee, right? Yeah. <laughs> although, although it's been a long time since I've been on a first date. <laughs> Me too, but I would definitely do coffee these days. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, Mark. So um, uh, either with or despite what's on the screen right now, uh, how should people contact? What's your preferred way? And uh, who should be contacting you? So the how would be obviously my website, marketingspark.co. Like Moshe, I really love the co. Uh, and the second would be LinkedIn. Just do a search for Mark Evans, Fractional CMO. Uh, I'm all over LinkedIn. I publish content almost daily. Uh, and otherwise, if my target audience is is CEOs of, of, as I said, companies that are small, but growing and excited about marketing and committed to marketing, uh, both financially and from a, from a mindset perspective, uh, and I basically position myself as a trusted partner, someone who is a go-to resource that can help them get things done and, and make an impact and do marketing that makes a difference um, based on their budgets and where they want to go. So uh, if you're a CEO and you're looking for marketing help, we should talk. Moshe, how, should, how and who? Uh, you can always contact me on LinkedIn. I'm right. pretty sure I'm the only Moshe poll track there. Uh, you can check out the Instant website. Brand messaging already. Way to go. Mm -hmm. Way to go getting uh, born with a name that many people have. <laughs> I, I don't get credit for that. That's my parents. But um, growth.co, <laughs> that's G-R-W-T-H dot C-O. There's uh, some great resources and content there. And of course, you can contact us through the forum. And both if you're a founder of an early stage startup that is um, post-product market fit and looking to build that machine for growth, uh, would love to have a conversation. If you're a marketer and want to potentially work with uh, us and join our, our group. Happy to have that conversation as well. And if I could do a quick plug for my podcast. Absolutely. If you are interested in early stage startups and growth, I do have a podcast called Product Market Fit. And we have uh, a weekly show there that we talk to, talk to founders about their growth journeys. Right on. All right. Congratulations on the podcast. You probably have way more experience at this than I do. So <laughs> I'm always, I'm always, it's always great when like guests who know a lot more come on and I get to like learn a little bit. Uh, all right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Moshe. Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, there are more episodes coming for sure. Uh, so thanks again for visiting with us today. You can visit and steal from me at winstonrights.com. Just look at everything there and steal whatever you want. And that's it until next time. Bye. Bye, guys.